was everywhere I looked lately. A subtle but persistent sense that something was just wrong, off, a few degrees to the left. Sure, everything seemed normal on the surface. People getting up, going to work, to the store, to dinner. But something had definitely changed. It was like someone high up the chain flipped a switch and put society on autopilot. The people were there, sure. But they weren't fully there, if you know what I mean. At first, it was just an odd feeling, a persistent itch. But that soon gave birth to an ugly awareness that a lot of these people have just been permanently disoriented from their bearings. Maybe we all have. The only sense of normal I seemed to feel anymore was the constant longing for a time when everything felt normal. A time I couldn't quite place. But I wasn't the only one. There was a blankness in people and an accumulating sense that each soul I passed by was becoming more and more alike. And the worst of them had become nothing more than empty vessels for brands, products, events, corporations, trends, ideologies, and identifications. The more that things and people got weird and desperate to express themselves, the more they all seemed the same. Words were becoming mere bywords, signals to the brain, passcodes and cues for action, but less and less ideas, concepts, and meanings lost in translation. The days flipped by, but they felt stage play hollow, like walking around in a dream you never fully wake up from. Was I awake? Was I still dreaming? Did it matter? That morning started like every other morning. I slept in late, but kept hitting the snooze button anyway, doling out ten minute slices of sleep to myself. It was sometime during that half-sleep, half-conscious period when a soft knock came at the door. The note was rather curt. But on the back was a call number and a time. And if I knew anything after a hard-boiled life, it was written in a feminine hand. I was charmed that someone was still literate enough to call my attention to an entry filed away under the Dewey Decimal System. I wasn't sure that line was still operating, since everything these days seemed to come with a website, but maybe there was someone still reading real books. At any rate, the library seemed pretty quiet. Well, libraries are usually quiet, but this place was desolate. The book she led me to was titled The Use of LSD in Psychotherapy, edited by one Harold A. Abramson. Basically, it had to do with a conference on D-lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD-25, to you and me, that was apparently held in 1959 and published by the New York City-based Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, a known cutout for the Central Intelligence Agency, doing research and a mind control throughout the Cold War. But why all the trouble to draw my attention to it? It was well known that the agency was involved in unethical LSD research, one of a number of ugly facts that got revealed to the public during the 70s when they held the church committee hearings. Still, you had to wonder how far it all truly went. Apparently, Abramson went a lot farther than people realized. This unpublished report from 1958, which ended up in my hands, described a method for testing aerosolized LSD, but apparently it determined that it was only a third as effective as oral dosing. Maybe they tested the food, too. So what were they really up to? Aerosol implied the masses. A cursory internet search confirmed the worst. Harold Abramson was a doctor connected to a gang of patriotic OSS and CIA scientists who played around pretty seriously with dishing out the stuff to score some points in the clandestine world of espionage. Nobody knows how far their mischief played out, but the stuff they do tell you is bad enough. I read about the horrors of some poor sap named Frank Olson, 
who found chemical warfare and LSD research to be a deadly cocktail. Not the stuff itself, mind you, but the reaction it caused with his superiors in the agency after they realized his hesitation in using it on human populations. Olson's specialty, it turned out, had been the development of aerosolized anthrax. The papers said he committed suicide by jumping out of a 13th story Manhattan hotel room. It was only decades later that the family started asking nosy questions, and researchers came across the real story. Murder, circling around his unassuming identity as a bacteriologist and biological warfare scientist. It seems that a circle of CIA researchers working at Fort Detrick, including Frank Olson, were surreptitiously administered LSD in their cocktails by the chieftains of the MK Ultra project back in 1953 when it all started. Frank Olson had something of a bad trip and decided to quit the funny business of strange substances. His friends said that he was having a nervous breakdown. One of those was Harold Abramson, himself an LSD researcher on unwitting patients, who had apparently given Olson psychiatric advice just before his untimely death, only nine days after it all started. Maybe we'll never know what Frank Olson figured out after he was dosed, or who pushed him out of that window, but it's enough to make any mind wander. Perhaps it was connected to his activities in France, where the CIA had a team operating in 1951, at the same time that a mass hysteria took over the tiny French village called Pont Saint-Esprit. That's where some 250 inhabitants were driven to the brink of insanity. 50 of them were institutionalized. Seven died. People tried to drown themselves because they thought they were being eaten by snakes. A kid tried to strangle his own grandmother, and one guy even thought he was a plane and jumped out of a second-story window. Officially, it was blamed on ergot poisoning that they claim was accidentally baked into the town's bread. The fungus grows on rye, but it also happens to be the source from which LSD was derived. Turns out, however, it's based on research from a guy named H.P. Abarelli Jr. Declassified documents showed that it was a covert test conducted by the CIA and U.S. Army, who not only gassed the town with aerosolized LSD, but also spiked the food using LSD courtesy of the Swiss-based pharmaceutical company Sandoz. It was all just to see how people would react. Around the same time, CIA man George Hunter White was conducting his own rogue test on aerosolized LSD on the New York subway system. There's not a whole lot of detail about how that went over, but documents confirm that at least two tests took place in the early 50s. It sounded like the stuff of fiction, figuring out how people would react in mass to psychoactive substances. Maybe what they had more in mind was a population that wouldn't, no, couldn't question things. Everybody liked to rally and protest about changing things, but whatever really came of it. A few angry folks with signs and a mob of people that couldn't be bothered for the time, let alone some cause. Maybe there was a reason for it all. Station. Please remember you must have a validated fare before boarding the train. Some reason why things seem so off. Did it mean we should have watched the vents, or the skies, or the foods at the grocery store? Was it tasteless, odorless, or detectable in any way? Maybe some scientist would stumble upon a curious reading. Maybe some journalist would accidentally do his job. Maybe somebody important would stop whatever was going on. Maybe we were all sleepwalking through the motions. A few people read the headlines, and all the others watch the primetime shows, and all the other facades of what life was supposed to be all about. Left, then right, smile, nod, repeat, and drudge ever onward through the fog.
60 years ago, it occurred to me that the scientific methods and the results obtained by scientific research might be applied to the problem of the organization of science. Among the fields of new sciences was one I called chemical psychology. Relationships between chemical substances and biopsychological elements, the effects of opium, bromides, hashes, ether, alcohol, tobacco, etc. Pain was relieved, moods were changed, sleepiness, dreaminess, etc. induced. What are these narcotics? Let's take it from the scientific viewpoint. Many are indispensable for pain-killing and sleep-producing secure and escape from reality. In the following years I collected whatever material I came across, such as E.V. McCollum's studies on the adverse influence of Manzini's free diets upon maternal behavior in rats, as well as that of the less scientifically controlled data from primitive tribes concerning the effect of certain herbs on behavior. During the work of the League of Nations Committee on Chemical Warfare, one of the participating scientists told me of his own experiments with a virgin mouse under whose skin he had injected a particular chemical substance. The mouse started building a nest. I saw perfectly well then the danger of a government putting some chemical substances in the bread before elections. And I, myself, played with the idea of a pacificant gas to be sprayed over troops and populations to make them friendly, peaceful, or at least passive, to prevent war. Did that really just happen? It seemed like the punchline of a bad joke, but nobody was laughing. There is a tremendous advantage in experimenting with humans, for while you can deal with unicellular and less developed multicellular organisms on the basis of behavioristic psychology only, in man you can use introspective psychology and all the psychological disciplines based on communication as well. A mathematical formula or model for the human individual would help considerably. It goes without saying that experiments would have to be conducted on emotionally and mentally abnormal in addition to normal people, all ages, both sexes, etc. I need not to go through details. The way they figured it, was everyone expendable? I mentioned the possibility of inventing cocktails to clear thoughts and to enable representatives to work day and night in urgent situations. Pharmacology to me is a science of drugs given with the intention of preventing or curing disease or to enhance the physical or mental welfare of men and animals. I traced the voice on the reel back to a 1954 panel on neuropharmacology held in Princeton, New Jersey and sponsored by the Macy's Foundation the transcript of which was edited for print by our good friend, Dr. Harold Abramson. The guy speaking on the tape was one William Borberg, the permanent delegate for Denmark to the United Nations, and before that, to the League of Nations. The guest list for this neuropharmacology meeting included known CIA MKUltra contractors, including not just Abramson, but Carl C. Pfeiffer, Henry K. Beecher, Amadeo S. Marazzi, Hudson Hoagland, and many others who were inextricably connected to that line of dark and unethical research. Those comments weren't made in jest. These people were serious. Elite scientists in invitation-only meetings talking about gassing the whole population into complacency in the name of some kind of world peace. A second world war and the reality of a nuclear war 
led way to a Cold War where all the tools of modern science intersected with justifiable reasons to experiment with people. They had now come up with countless ways for dealing with enemies and suspects, for getting people riled up, and for keeping them calm. Increasing energy, keeping thinking clear, doing without sleep, subduing excitement in assemblies, assuring mother love, abolishing sorrow, and contributing to the prevention of war. All this seems to be within reach. Maintaining social order was the highest priority. Perhaps there was even a chemical reason for the growing wave of apathy. As to the fields to be applied, I think some of them are obvious. Looking around at society, I had to wonder how far had they really gone. It sounded like they meant to have peace by any means. But was it even really still peace if it was all coercive and nobody was the wiser? At first, it was just an odd feeling, a persistent itch. But that soon gave birth to an ugly awareness that a lot of these people have just been permanently disoriented from their bearings. Maybe we all have. The only sense of normal I seemed to feel anymore was the constant longing for a time when everything felt normal, a time I couldn't quite place. But I wasn't the only one. There was a blankness in people, and an accumulating sense that each soul I passed by was becoming more and more alike, and the worst of them had become nothing more than empty vessels. Did it matter? That morning started like every other morning. I slept in late, but kept hitting the snooze button anyway, doling out ten minute slices of sleep to myself. It was sometime during that half-sleep, half-conscious period when a soft knock came at the door. The note was rather curt. But on the back was a call number and a time. And if I knew anything after a hard-boiled life, it was written in a feminine hand. I was charmed that someone was still literate enough to call my attention to an entry filed away under the Dewey Decimal System. I wasn't sure that line brands, products, events, corporations, trends, ideologies, and identifications. The more that things and people got weird and desperate to express themselves, the more they all seemed the same. Words were becoming mere bywords, signals to the brain, passcodes and cues for action, but less and less ideas, concepts, and meanings lost in translation. The days flipped by, but they felt stage play hollow, like walking around in a dream you never fully wake up from. Was I awake? Was I still dreaming? It was everywhere I looked lately. A 
subtle but persistent sense that something was just wrong, off, a few degrees to the left. Sure, everything seemed normal on the surface. People getting up, going to work, to the store, to dinner. But something had definitely changed. It was like someone high up the chain flipped a switch and put society on autopilot. The people were there, sure. But they weren't fully there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> 